Before we start, make sure you hit that subscribe button to get notified of each of our amazing how-to videos. With that being said, let's begin. Injection molding is one of the most widely used manufacturing processes in the world today. Most plastic items in your home, automobile, and your electronics are created through injection molding. The advantage of injection molding is that it can easily and dependably create thin walled parts. But the disadvantage is that the tooling costs, the molds, are expensive to produce as they are machined from metals such as aluminum and steel. However, an injection mold need not be expensive, as you're about to learn. An injection mold is the perfect answer for molding model parts, such as model trains, cars, transformer superheroes, and garage figure modeling and similar items. For our example, we have chosen to reproduce the body of a Volkswagen model car. The thickness of the wall is about 1 16th of an inch, and it would be difficult to mold otherwise without gaps in material coverages due to air traps. The materials required to create an injection mold to reproduce the car body are plasticine clay, clay modeling tools, Moldrite 25 silicone to create the rubber mold, Castees resin to create the plastic casting, serious polyurethane dyes to color the resin, foam board for the mold box, a box cutter, a glue gun, glue sticks, mixing containers, and craft mixing sticks or an electric drill with a mechanical mixer, egg corn nuts, small hollow tubes, a large syringe, and a vacuum chamber. Finally, you'll need duct tape, mold release, and rubber bands. We begin by covering the outside of the car with a plastic wrap to protect it from the clay we will add. We tape the plastic to the outside perimeter of the auto body. See the arrow pointing to the piece of tape in the mold maker's hands as he begins the process of protecting the exterior. Once the plastic wrap is attached, the excess is cut off using a scissors. The car body is then placed upside down on a piece of foam board or cardboard, which is used as a base. Pieces of oil-based clay are then placed tightly around the perimeter to begin building a wall of clay around the exterior of the model. The mold maker continues to build up the wall using small pieces of clay. His objective is to make it level with all of the outside edges of the model. Now that the clay has been built up to the outside edges of the model, the mold maker begins to square off the clay using clay modeling tools. He uses a number of clay modeling tools for the smoothing and refining of the edges. When the edges of the clay are perfectly flush to the model and level, it's time to build the mold box. This is accomplished using additional foam board on which we have made a one inch parallel cut to one side. This allows the foam board to be easily bent around the model. The foam board is pressed tightly against the clay. The outside edge of the foam board is hot glued to the baseboard to not only hold it in place, but to prevent the silicone rubber that we will pour later from After the foam board wall is completed, small pieces of clay are placed inside where the foam board meets the clay parting line to seal the gap. If the gap isn't sealed, silicone will leak out. Clay the entire gap and then up the sides where the foam boards meet each of its sections. Now you must return and re-smooth the clay wall so it remains 90 degrees to the edge of the model. When the clay has been smoothed out to 90 degrees to the model's edge, it is time to add the mold keys. The mold keys allow the two halves of the mold to register precisely when the mold halves are put together. For this purpose, we use egg cord nuts embedded in the clay parting line about a half inch from each other. It's time to mix the silicone material. In this example, we are using Moldrite 25, a two-part addition cure silicon with a 10 to 1 mix ratio. We begin by placing an empty container on our gram scale and pouring out the base into it. 
the arrow points to the digital readout on the gram scale that the mold maker watches to determine the correct weight of the material. Once the base is poured into the mixing container, we add the catalyst to it. This is added at the rate of one-tenth of a gram weight of the poured base. When the two parts are combined, they must be mixed well so that there is no marbling of colors and there is one uniform color throughout. The silicone mix is now put into a vacuum chamber for the de-airing process to remove the air bubbles. Air bubbles will cause mold deformations and unwanted cosmetic issues. Pour the material high, slowly, and in a narrow stream starting from the corner of the mold box or mold, letting the material flow freely into the box or mold cavity. This method will usually not introduce any new bubbles into the vacuumed material. Continue pouring in the same spot as the silicone fills the mold box. Continue pouring until the silicone fills the mold box to the top. When the mold has cured, usually in about three hours for mold right 25, remove the duct tape and the foam board to reveal the first half of the mold. Now that the bottle has been demolded, flip it over so that the silicone mold is facing downward and the bottle is facing toward the ceiling and begin removing all the clay and the acorn mold key nuts. Clean and polish the mold with a dry towel or washcloth which has a slightly rough surface. This should remove the balance of any of the residual clay. Once the silicone is clean and free of clay, we can begin creating the mold box to create the second half of the mold. We used scored foam board as before to surround the bottom of the mold and to create the new mold box. Rubber bands are used to hold the mold box together while it's being assembled. The base of the mold box, as well as all vertical seams, are sealed using a hot glue gun. In preparation for the second silicone rubber pour, the inside of the mold box is coated with a mold release. It's particularly important to cover the bottom half of the cured silicone mold as silicone will stick fast to silicone. So spray at least three light coats of mold release on all silicone rubber surfaces allowing each coat to dry before adding the next coat. Use light coats as the silicone will pick up all the drip marks if the release is allowed to run. The two-part silicone mold rubber is weighed out, combined, mixed, and vacuumed just as was done in the first half of the mold making procedure. It's then poured holding the container high above the mold and in a narrow stream to further aid the escape of any residual air bubbles. The pouring is always done in one spot to allow the liquid mold rubber to envelop the model, further pushing out any trapped surface air. When the mold box is filled, the silicone is left undisturbed to cure. When the silicone rubber has cured, the mold box is removed to reveal the completed two-part silicone mold. The mold halves are spread apart and the original model is removed. Now it's time to survey the inner mold to determine where to place air holes and injection fill holes in hole the high spots to eliminate the air traps which will prevent the casting material to evenly fill the mold. A small hollow tube with one end sharpened is fitted to an electric drill and bored completely through the rubber so it comes out to the bottom of the mold. The arrow points to the tip of the hollow tube that is bored through the rubber mold. The arrows are pointing to the other holes that have been bored through from the top of the inner rubber mold to its backside. Using the box cutter, the mold maker is widening each hole to make certain there are no ragged edges obscuring them. Examining the top side of the inner rubber mold, you can see that the mold maker bored holes all along the top edge of the mold. That's because air tends to flow to the top in liquids and it needs a place to escape or it will create air gaps in the cast material when it's cured. The vent holes are spaced about one inch apart. Not only are the vent holes added all the way around the perimeter, but they're also added to the top surfaces of the inner mold where air will tend to accumulate. The holes will allow the air to escape. Remember, this is an injection mold, which means the casting material is forced into the rubber under pressure. 
the air that is in the mold has no place to go, the cask will cure with hollow spaces where the trapped and compressed air has prevented the liquid casting material, in our example it'll be resin, to fill the mold completely. Once all the vent holes have been created and the entrance holes have been cleared, it's time for casting. At this point, the mold is reassembled and held together with a number of rubber bands. Castee's resin, which is a two-part polyurethane resin with a one-to-one -one mix ratio, is prepared for use. One part, part A, is poured into a 16-ounce cup, and then part B is poured into a separate cup, filled to the same level as part A, and before mixing, the mold maker adds red polyurethane dye to part A and mixes it well. The dye is highly concentrated, so less than a half ounce is sufficient to create a bright red color. Once the dye is thoroughly mixed into part A, the part A and part B are combined in a third cup and vigorously mixed. A plastic syringe draws up the cast ease resin as it injected into the center vent hole. As the casting material is forcibly injected, it begins to overflow some of its vent holes. That's what the mold maker is aiming for. This signifies that the mold has pushed out all of its air in these areas. The arrows point to where the casting material is beginning to exit the mold. The mold maker goes around to the vent holes that do not show any overflow and injects them with additional casting material. It's now easier to see the overflow of the excess casting material. The objective is to see the casting material flow from every spew and vent hole. The image shows the mold maker filling the last sprue hole. The mold is set aside undisturbed for 15 minutes or so until the cast ease resin cures. The mold maker then breaks and removes the ejector from the spew and vent holes. The mold is opened to reveal the finished thin wall casting. He examines it for flaws then he carefully removes the flashing with his box cutter. The very thin windows are cut out using the knife to produce a perfect injection mold casting. Here is the finished and cleaned up car body injection mold casting.